Hey there and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 4 review. And today we're going to be diving into the episode Queen Banana, which introduces a brand new hero using the Bee Miraculous and potentially still the last time we'll ever see Chloe get akumatized during the show. So while at first it may seem just like a filler episode, it actually has a lot of key moments and important story progression. That being said though, let's get into the episode. We start the episode with Marinette and the Kwamis together, which has seemingly become a ritual at this point. A lot of the episodes this season have opened with Marinette in her room talking to the Kwamis about what's going on in her life, or talking about how they're going to fight Shadow Moth. At a certain point it kind of feels repetitive and like it doesn't really add anything to the episode at all, and it's just there to pad out the runtime and make sure they actually use the Kwamis that they spent time designing. Anyway, we see that Marinette's been designing costumes for a student film her class is producing, which tells the story of a superhero of creation fighting against a supervillain of destruction. And whichever student wrote the script for this story does not seem to be a Cat Noir fan based on these powers. Even in a film within the show, Cat Noir gets done dirty. Realising that she's going to be late, she runs out of her room and the scene transitions to a news report, describing how the students are being helped by the fictional version of Thomas Asterix, are being funded by the mayor and having the film put in select cinemas by the film producer guy from the Pigeon episode. And I think the highlight of this little sequence was calling Thomas Asterix a famous film director. They really couldn't resist, could they? Anyway, we get to witness Chloe realise that her half-sister Zoe is starring in the lead role and subsequently have a meltdown, with Sabrina trying to calm her down by giving a banana. And I'm sorry, but this is hilarious. How did the writers come up with the idea that they wanted her akumatized into a banana fanatic? Is it just because it's the colour yellow and she was once the Bee Miraculous holder, which is also yellow? The writers do deserve credit with their world building and overall character design and background, but this felt a bit weird. I guess they just wanted an excuse for Chloe to ride around on a giant gorilla later in the episode. Chloe then storms into the classroom and begins hurling insults at everybody and demanding that she's allowed to star in the film instead of Zoe, because her father's the one paying for everything. Even though he isn't, but whatever. The class then tells her that Zoe's better for the role than she is, with a random teacher even recounting some disparaging remarks she'd made about the film and the class previously. I'm not really sure why a teacher would waste time writing stuff like that down and carrying it around in a journal in his back pocket just for the opportune moment, but you do you I guess. Chloe then demands that she be given her sister's role, or else, and then she storms out saying that she's the one who should become a star. So clearly we're continuing off from Soul Crusher where there's going to be some constant competition between Zoe and Chloe, and really honing in on the fact that Zoe is the better person. The next day we see Asterix in the class turn up at the producer's office to finalise the plans for the film, only to be confronted by Chloe and the producer who reveals that Andre had paid him off so that Chloe could become part of the film, with Zoe getting the boot. So did he pay him with his own money, or more city funds? Because honestly, I think somebody needs to file a corruption complaint against the mayor. And so much for Andre being a good stepdad. He promises he'd talk to Chloe and make her see sense, and then he ends up caving and paying off the producer, and then he doesn't say a word when Chloe's threatening to have Zoe sent back to New York. Yikes. The producer then throws them out, and the scene transitions to the film shoot. On the shoot, Chloe quickly starts throwing her weight around to make the film what she wants, rather than what would be best for the film. She starts by demanding that she's allowed to play the hero instead of the villain. She then changes the hero from the hero of creation to Queen Banana, a weird banana inspired cowgirl who has a banana as a weapon and drives a giant banana themed car. She changes the scene from being the hero saving a bunch of civilians to saving Adrian who's being held in a cage in a helicopter. And then she throws in a giant yellow gorilla who throws exploding bananas as the new main villain. And honestly, whilst it sounds like a train wreck of a movie, I would watch that film. A giant gorilla who throws exploding bananas versus a banana cowgirl. Sign me up. After realising that the shoot's not living up to her standards, she tells the crew that the day's over and leaves in her limo heading back to her hotel. As soon as she leaves, Marinette decides to lead a little rebellion to take over the film and make it the way they'd intended before Chloe came in and tried to ruin everything with her selfishness. They agree and when Chloe arrives the next day for the shoot, it's revealed that they'd already filmed everything the night before and had a screening for it organised at a local cinema. But how? How could they possibly film all of it that night, then edit it together, and add special effects? How? They are high schoolers. It took them less than a day to do all of that. Makes no sense. Chloe then makes her way to the cinema and bears witness to the most glorious film in the history of creation, where Zoe and Milen, acting as the hero and villain, have a Star Wars inspired sword fight before randomly forgiving each other in seconds and hugging it out. This is also a film I would watch. I guarantee it would be truly god-awful, but I'd watch it. Chloe then demands to know who authorised this film to go ahead, to be met with Gabriel via Skype, revealing it was him all along that paid for it, because he thought it would be moving, and he liked Adrian's performance in the sample scene. And was he legit watching the whole film through Skype on a tablet? 
Or is he just on call for any relevant moment he needs to be? And I love that the mayor just rolled over and took that as well. The producer truly screwed him over. He took his bribe, and then he took another bribe from Gabriel, which means the mayor paid for a movie that never even got made in the first place. Can't really say he doesn't deserve it though. Chloe then storms out, and Gabriel begins his evil villain monologue, transforming into Shadow Moth and sending out Namak and Akuma. And there's a couple questions here. When Chloe's storming out, you see that Gabe is in front of his painting in his dining room area. But then from his perspective, he's in his lair just as Chloe's storming out. So does he have a custom background for his video calls to pretend he's in his house and not in his creepy villain base? Or did he start moving to the hideout as he sees her turn but before he hangs up the call? Also, did he even hang up or even mute it? It looked to me like he just decided to transform straight up on call. Imagine how that would have seemed to everybody in the movie theatre as they realise who Shadow Moth actually is. And now, I kind of wish that's what happened. Also, it's pretty funny that he funded this ridiculous film just so Chloe would get angry. There are so many ways to get people akumatized, and he chooses such a convoluted way every single time. As she's storming out, Chloe finds herself confronted by Adrian, who initially assumes she's there to help comfort her. But after she reveals that she's planning to have Zoe sent back to New York as revenge, Adrian tells her that she should apologize. And that since she hasn't changed and still keeps acting awful to everybody in class, he can't be her friend anymore. And yes, she has had a rough morning, but I can't say she doesn't deserve it. She has had the most negative character arc in the show by far, and is honestly the most annoying character. And big call alert, I actually think I preferred Lila at this point. Of course, in response to her wounded ego, Chloe yells at him and runs off to her limo where she's transformed into the villain Queen Banana. A villain who turns people into bananas with her banana gun and rides a giant ape who fires exploding bananas. I swear somebody must have eaten a whole bunch of bananas before writing this script. It is honestly a fever dream. Chloe then smashes up the cinema to try and get to her sister, turning her class and a whole bunch of civilians into bananas in the meantime. Cat Noir and Ladybug both transform and confront Queen Banana on the roof, but kind of get outclassed by her gear. They even bother to comment on it in the show, so it's like Shadow Moth has actually pulled out all the stops for this one. But why doesn't he pull out all the stops every time? He literally always loses, so he may as well try a bit harder to let his villains have a chance at winning for once. Anyway, after another fight that the heroes lose, Ladybug uses her lucky charm which creates a scooter with glue and helmets. However, this isn't quite enough for her to create a winning strategy. Until, Zoe conveniently walks out and confronts Chloe, telling her she needs to stop, and if she does, she'll surrender. Chloe, of course, double-crosses her and tells the gorilla to grab her, with Zoe saved at the last moment by Ladybug and the scooter. But the gorilla full-on smashes his hand into the ground, so it looked to me like he was just gonna kill her. He hit it so hard there was a cloud of dust. If she was there, she'd be dead. Just saying. Cat Noir then tries to hit Queen Banana's car with Cataclysm, but misses and hits the monkey instead, forcing him to fight him whilst Chloe chases Ladybug and Zoe in her floating car. To escape Queen Banana, Ladybug drives the scooter into a subway station, which is too narrow for Queen Banana's car to follow. And despite the fact that subways have multiple entryways and exits, and the fact that they could catch a train to a different station, Queen Banana says they have no escape, and that they have to come out sooner or later. Guess being a villain smooths out your brain completely. In the subway station, Ladybug tells Zoe that she needs her help and gives her the Bee Miraculous. And despite Zoe's self-doubt and belief that it will make Chloe even angrier, with Pollen and Ladybug's encouragement, she transforms into Vesperia, who's basically just Queen Bee with a cooler costume. And a better personality. And the desire to actually be a hero to help other people. Anyway, Ladybug distracts Queen Banana whilst Vesperia sneaks out another entrance to the subway, because... Duh. Come on now. Anyway, just as Cat Noir's about to be defeated by the giant gorilla, Vesperia conveniently saves him and paralyzes it with venom. But not before Cat Noir's thrown into a metal wall like a human dart. Ouch. Cat Noir has the worst luck, I swear. Then our heroine introduces herself to Cat Noir, who sort of vaguely flirts with her, but not as intensely as he's done in the past. But to me, it definitely felt like she took his breath away, so to speak, especially when compared to Queen Bee. And then once again, just as Ladybug's about to be defeated by Queen Banana, Cat Noir comes out of nowhere and hits her car with Cataclysm, destroying it. And I have to wonder, why do they love doing this so much? Why bother having Ladybug almost lose just to save her? It doesn't add to the stakes because you know she's not going to lose. So you may as well not include that last second save. It just turns into plot armor. Anyway, Queen Bee is able to grab Ladybug and holds her gun to her head execution style, demanding the Miraculouses. But why doesn't she just take the earrings off straight away? Her hand's on her shoulder. I doubt Ladybug's going to react in time to stop her. So why not just do that? It reveals who Ladybug is and completely ruins the hero team forever. Gabe could then just dedicate the rest of his life trying to ruin Marinette's. 
so that she'd be akumatized and give him all the miraculouses herself. Oh well. Vesperia then distracts Chloe with some well-earned trash talk before she gets bananaed so that Ladybug can glue the gun in its holster and save the day. Hooray! Ladybug then reverts everything and makes a charm so that Chloe won't be akumatized anymore. But she rejects it and runs off, allowing Shadow Moth to send out another Akuma to try and get her. In response to all this, Zoe decides to take the charm and convince Chloe to keep it. Back at the cinema, Chloe demands that she be allowed to make her movie, but Zoe tells her enough is enough and that she needs to chill out. To be honest though, if Chloe really wanted to, couldn't she probably get a movie made with actional professionals considering how much cash her dad throws at her to keep her happy? She wouldn't even have to work with people she hates. Seriously, this just feels like the better solution. Chloe then tries to get Zoe sent back to New York, but her dad finally grows a set and tells her off. Probably for the first time ever, honestly. And Zoe recites the final lines of the film they made, telling her she loves her and that they're sisters, regardless of how Chloe treats her. And then she tricks her into keeping the charm by telling her that their mother gave it to Zoe. And luckily enough, this is just as the Akuma's about to get Chloe. Another last second save. Chloe, however, doesn't even change and still swears revenge before storming off, and even tells Adrian to get stuffed. Yikes. It's nice to know though that she won't ever get a redemption arc, because this would have been the time to start it. And that brings us to the end of the episode, and honestly it was pretty good, just a bit too plot armory for my tastes. It's fine to have the villains beat up on the heroes, but having three last second saves back to back to back is overdone and makes it feel cheap. And the whole banana theme felt very silly and random. But I guess it was funny, so that does even out. But as always, that's just my opinion, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? Make sure to leave a comment and let me know.